484-5737. And I think we'll go directly to the phones and talk to Michael from the San Francisco Bay Area. My tongue getting a little caught there in my mouth. Hi, Michael. Welcome. Thank you, Steve. Um, you were talking last week about the significance of certain numbers in the Bible, uh, 10, 12, 40. There's a bunch of them, I think. But uh, it made me think, uh, did um, Peter make a mistake when he appointed a, a 12th uh, replacement uh, apostle? No, I think 12 was the right number for the apostles. Now, some people think but, that some people think that Paul should have been number 12, but Paul never seemed yeah, to think that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, Paul never Paul seemed to think that. by right. Jesus. All the rest of the apostles were chosen by Jesus. And it seemed like, you know, if Jesus thought it was so important, he could have appointed one when he was there the 40 days on earth. That's true. Uh, that is true. And uh, I don't know why they waited until Jesus was gone to do that. Um, all I know is that the, the New Testament never indicates that this was a mistake. The, the, of course, the only place that mentions Matthias, which is the one that they chose— to replace Judas is in Acts chapter 1, where it tells about the decision being made. <clears throat> they they found a couple of candidates they thought would be uh, met the qualifications, and then they, they drew lots to see which one was God's choice. And it says the lot fell on Matthias. And then uh, <clears throat> and who wrote the book of Acts said, and from then on, uh, Matthias was counted among the, the twelve. Which means that right. there never came there never came a time afterward that Matthias w was seen to be a bad a bad choice. Um, now the interesting thing is that Luke said this without making any kind of critical comment. When Luke was a huge fan and great friend and traveling companion with Paul, and uh, right. you know if Luke had thought, boy, these guys really blew it. Uh, you know, Paul is Paul's the man. You know, Paul's the guy that should be in that spot. Um, it's interesting that Luke tells the story without any uh, editorializing at all and simply ends, ends it by saying, um, <clears throat> and uh, he was numbered, as Matthias was numbered with the 11 apostles. And then in the, the next several chapters, there are references to the apostles, plural, um, which with, without indicating that any others were meant, were meant than you know, the, the original 11 and, and Matthias. So Luke just kind of takes it in stride that Matthias is number 12. Now, obviously, Paul was an apostle, too, at a later time. But I don't think that Paul regarded himself to be of the same uh, group as the 12 or belonging to the same group. You know, it says that Jesus said to the 12, in the <clears throat> regeneration, you 12 will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, which suggests but that Jesus their ministry— was there too, wasn't he? Judas was there, but he was replaced, right, by, by Matthias. And so there it were 12 again. 12. Pardon? Okay. And so it wasn't the 12 he was speaking to because he was replaced. So, um, well, he was, talking, no, wait, wait, because... he, he was talking to the 12 as a, as a category. Uh, it's true. I mean, if I, if I had, uh, you know, a, a team of, of 12 uh, players and, uh, and our team was uh, going to, to, uh, to play – in a big game, you know, uh, a month later, I said, hey, you guys, were, we're all going to go play this game uh, next month. And then in the meantime, one of the guys dies and he's replaced by someone else. It, it doesn't change the fact that we, the team, you know, are going to go play that game. It's just that the constituents in the team, uh, yes. the members of the team have changed. But the 12 was considered to be a category or a team uh, that Jesus chose, and Judas was obviously one uh, had a position in it initially, but surrendered that by going away, and uh, and then Matthias took his place. But but Jesus indicated that the ministry of the twelve would be specifically significant toward the twelve tribes of Israel. Now Paul didn't see himself as sent uh, to the to the Israelites. He was, Jesus called him on the road to Damascus to be an apostle to the Gentiles, and uh, and so later on, when uh, Paul and Barnabas came to visit the Twelve, uh, they weren't all there, but Peter, James, and John were there. It says in Acts chapter 2, it says that they, the, uh, the guys in Jerusalem, which were the, you know, the representatives of the Twelve, Peter, James, and John, were, they, it says they agreed that they were sent to the circumcision and that Paul and his team were sent to the uncircumcision, meaning the Gentiles. 
So there were recognized two different missions, a mission to the Jews and a mission to the Gentiles. And, and uh, it was agreed on by Paul and the others. Paul's mission was to head up the, the, the team that went to the Gentiles, whereas the other guys were set aside to go toward the Jews. And so I don't think that Paul ever saw himself as one of the 12 or belonging to that category. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I think there's an argument made for the other side because, uh, you know, I mean, you made the team analogy, but Jesus was picking the team. So he definitely chose Paul, where the other was chosen by lots, basically, among the two. So, but well, I they believed, point, they believed yeah, they, they believed that, that in casting lots, that Jesus was making the choice. And, and they had, uh, you know, there's, there's a precedent for that in the Old Testament, of course. And Proverbs 16 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is of the Lord. So, I mean, well, they, there's, they there's actually said, Peter Lord, you should... another mistake, too. <clears throat> Pardon? Peter is, has, did make another mistake in the Bible, too, where Paul called him out. Yeah, Paul, uh, Peter made a number of mistakes. Uh, that's true. Right. And, but the fact that Peter is the one who suggested the replacement of Judas in Acts chapter 1 uh, should not be, it should not be ignored that the other apostles went along with it. This was apparently a unanimous uh, choice they all made. Peter often spoke up more, uh, you know, uh, abruptly than it others. A, it was a choice among the 120 so or people. It wasn't among the apostles themselves. Uh, among the what? The apostles themselves? Well, well, the, apo- the other apostles the were there. The 120 something made the decision and, as a group, not the uh, apostles alone. Well, you're right. I mean, all the better. All the better. You had all the apostles agreeing and the 120. So, in other words, it was a unanimous choice of the whole church, but not not excluding the apostles. And the apostles were the ones that I believe were. Uh, Christ chose so if to. If there's twelve thrones, him. one of those isn't for uh, Paul. Then, I think not. No, no. I, okay. I expect he has his own. I expect he has his own throne. Okay. I appreciate it, Steve. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, Michael. Good talking to you. Thanks for calling. Okay, Jim from Ukaipa, California. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Hi, Steve. I Hi. have a question. I had this thought rattling around in my mind. Uh, Genesis 20, uh, 2, 21 said the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he's sleeping, one of the man's ribs was closed up uh, and uh, and he, he, he took that and, and made woman from it. And it, it is there any uh, correlation? Because, you know, a rib is like a bow. And, I'm, and I just keep thinking about this. I don't know if it means anything. Could it mean anything? Because there's certain things in the Bible that point to uh, the, uh, bigger thoughts, if, if you want me to put it that way. I'm thinking about the helix curve. And, and is there any You mean of the, of the DNA, the, the helix, uh, the, the double right, helix? because the double helix. And when he says rib, uh, has anybody ever thought that what God was really trying to say in a, in a way that we could understand uh that's now we can understand a lot more as things go on. Was he speaking of the helix curve? Well, I, said, you know, I, 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 I have mean, no way of, I have no way of knowing if that's no, what I he was either, referring to. Yeah. I didn't know if there was any, 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 uh, anybody that ever thought about that, or if there was, uh, uh, or if uh, Hebrew, there was, the word rib and curve could mean the same thing, like, you know, different words. I think the Hebrew word for rib means side, if I'm not mistaken, but I, I'm not positive. Uh, yeah, okay. but the, but the uh, yeah, uh, if, you know, if it was referring to the helix, or the double helix of the DNA molecule, um, you know, there'd be no words in Hebrew to describe that. So we'd have no way of knowing. Right. Okay. Just, just something I was thinking on. All right, Thank Tim. Thank you very much. God bless Bye-bye. you. Bye now. Pat from Connecticut, welcome to the Narrow Path. Hi, um, hi, Steve. Um, hi. I wish to challenge the. Um, yeah, my hands free here. I wish to challenge the thought that Revelation twelve, the woman, um, the thought that she is Israel. Okay. Um, okay, so I believe, uh, I believe the woman is Ruth. 
uh, in the book of Ruth, Naomi, I believe, represents the fallen away Israel. And I believe Ruth represents the Gentile church. And when uh, Ruth said, your God will be my God. And so, therefore, that's why uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, why she's under that, because she came under the covering of the God of Israel. And um, I do believe, as in Ruth, her baby restored Naomi, her, her being joined together with the uh, Boaz, who is the Jesus figure, um, by coming together with Jesus, the church, the bride, the Gentile church, is able to restore Israel. Um, it says at least twice in the Bible that we are called to make his people jealous. And so by us sharing the gospel, people are born again. And so we give birth. And um, so I believe that Ruth is the woman in 12. Well, is there any uh, reason that mm -hmm. Ruth, as opposed to any other woman in the Old Testament who gave birth, would be the likely candidate for that position? I'm, I'm not seeing it myself. I mean, you're certainly welcome to hold that view and, and live and die with it. Mm -hmm. when it won't hurt you. Uh, I just mm -hmm. don't, I'm just not seeing anything in the passage that points to Ruth. When I read Revelation, <clears throat> I read a, a book that's full of symbolism that's taken from Old Testament passages. And uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's very many hundreds, actually many hundreds of Old Testament uh, images and figures and so forth that are uh, recirculated in the book of Revelation. And uh, generally speaking, in order to make sense of the book of Revelation, it helps if we have some idea of what those things represented when they originally appeared. Now, uh, there, and so, I mean, that's why I think it's Israel, because it talks about the woman clothed in the sun with the moon at her feet and the 12, crown of 12 stars on her head. These are images, obviously, that come from Genesis 37 and the right. dream that Joseph had. And so they're mm -hmm. associated with Israel. Now, if they're, if they're associated with any person in Israel, any, any female in Israel, like a, an individual, I'm, then, I, then I think that's a little out of character for the book because other female images in the book of Revelation, generally speaking, are not referring to individual women, like the bride is not an individual and the, the harlot is not an individual woman, and yet they're both depicted as women. Um, so I, I think that it'd be kind of uncharacteristic for Revelation to use the image of a woman to mean an actual woman. But if it did, I would think the actual woman most, most uh, likely to be mentioned, since she gives birth to the male child who is to rule the nations with Rod, Rod of Iron, be Mary. Um, I believe her seed is the Messiah who is to rule the nations with Rod of Iron. And if we're going to nail the woman down to an actual individual in history, it would seem like Mary would be the best option. But I don't believe that Revelation is likely to be speaking of an individual woman here. Well, my thought, too, I mean, I'm thinking in a type. Um, I'm also thinking that um, as far as uh, who is to, okay, when you're reading in Revelation 12, um, you know, Jesus never ran from the devil. He, so he's, he took it all. Yeah. Um, so who else is supposed to rule? Um, we're supposed to rule with him. And so I think it represents that the child represents, uh, and, and I'm not sure, I actually believe it represents the 144,000. But here again, um, the reason why I'm bringing it before you is because I, um, I, I do see, uh, I'm sorry, I don't hold my thoughts long, but um, I do see that there are things that you say that would kind of support this, and I'd ha I didn't write it down. I'm kind of catching you. I've been wanting to call you. Um, so one of the things about the 144,000, um, I believe it, uh, yes, it could be Israel itself coming back and being restored, um, but you also, as you so pointedly point out a lot of times, is that Israel um, is not all those born within the line. Israel is okay. those, those who come to, you know, right. the God. Pat, let me jump in here. Let me jump in here because we've moved from chapter 12 to chapter 7 and so forth. And I think we could get through okay. the whole book of Revelation okay. if, we, okay. if we've uh, wandered enough. But let me just say this. 
that mm -hmm. um, the woman in Revelation 12 not only bears a child, but she mm -hmm. later flees into the wilderness because yes. she's pursued by the dragon. And mm -hmm. then in the wilderness, she has more children uh, before the end of the chapter. She's got other children too. Now, if we're going to make Ruth the woman, we're going to have to mm -hmm. find some way to make sense of this woman fleeing into the wilderness and having more children there. Now, if this is talking about the faithful remnant of Israel, as mm -hmm. I suggest, that makes perfectly good sense because they did flee. They fled from Jerusalem in AD 66 so they could escape from the Holocaust that was coming on Jerusalem and they went into the wilderness. They went to a city called Pella and there they were sustained through the, through the period of, uh, you know, of, tr of trial and Holocaust that came on their native town of Jerusalem. But then they also had other children, which are us. We are the children of the church. We're the children, uh, the, the Jerusalem, which is from above, is the mother of us all, Paul said in Galatians 4. So I'm inclined to, I, I'm inclined to stick with my position, but you're, uh, I, I appreciate you sharing yours. Uh, okay. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you. It, it, I will pray on that. Thank you. Okay, Pat. God bless you. Bye now. Uh, Scott from Tennessee, welcome to The Narrow Path. Fantastic. Uh, the parable that Jesus told in uh, Luke chapter 12 about the rich man, rich farmer who was successful and tore down his uh, stock barns and built bigger ones, uh, it looks like uh, God took his life just because of wicked plans and wicked intentions. He hadn't done anything like that yet except just think about it and plan about it. Uh, so let me, the question is, could, you, could God uh, bless a person today uh, just based on his good intention and his plans, since God knows the future. Could God do what if he knows, if someone has good intentions could God, good plans, could God do what? But, but just like God uh, punished the wicked man just for his intentions and his plans, could God bless a person today uh, because of his good intentions and plans? Because God knows he would fulfill those things since he knows the future. Well, yeah, people who make good plans are people with a good heart and people with bad plans are people with a bad heart and God judges the heart. Now, of course, the Bible does say we'll be judged by our deeds, by our works, which is simply to say our works show what's in our hearts. But in addition to the works we actually perform, there are no doubt works that we contemplate that we never get around to doing, both for good and for ill. Um, so, yeah, I think that I think that the works that we do and the works that we contemplate, uh, the ones at least we agree to, even if they, we never do them, I think those reveal what's in our heart. And I, we belong to Christ or not, at, at, insofar as our hearts are his or not. And uh, if our hearts are his, our, our works show it. If our hearts are not his, our works also show that. So, uh, yeah, the, the works we do are works that we plan to do. Or, or maybe we do spontaneously because it shows our character. But there are also works we may plan to do that we don't get around to, but they would no doubt be, uh, you know, of the same sort as the, as the types we do. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't know if God's going to, I don't know how God's going to divvy out rewards, if that's what you're saying. You know, if, if I, I, really, I really wanted to do this good thing, and I really intended to, uh, but, you know, uh, it just didn't happen. I, I wasn't able to, you know, I mean, something prevented it. I died first. Um, well, yeah, I, I think God, God will probably bless a person for having made those plans, um, uh, as well as if okay. they've done that. All right. Just wanted your thoughts. Thanks. Thanks All right. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Al from Canada. Welcome to the narrow path. Thanks for calling. Uh, I'm, I thought I was hitting his button. I guess I hit the wrong button. Sorry. There we go. Al, there you go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for answering my call. Yeah, you're echoing really bad. Uh, or do, you, do you have your speakerphone on, I suppose? Oh, that's the problem, yeah. Yeah, now it's better, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm just, uh, you caught me at the wrong time here. But uh, oh, didn't give me one second. I, re I really appreciate you answering all the uh, all the questions, and uh, you're very patient, and you're, and you're, uh, you don't cut people off. Yeah. You give them lots of time. I, I really like that of you. Anyway, what what I was going to phone about is the 
we, 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 I heard lots of people phoning in about the rapture and all that. And, uh, and um, can I just uh, read you something? Sure. From the, uh, what it says in, in Revelation and uh, Matthew, where it says there will be great tribulation. Mm-hmm. Are you still listening? I am. Uh, please yeah, uh, get to your point, please, because we don't have very much time uh, here. As patient you, as I am. As patient yeah, as I am, but the, the clock has its limits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until the time no, no, no nor ever shall be, Matthew twenty four twenty one, And mm-hmm. it says this period is described in vivid detail in Revelation 18. And then it also says, like, uh, uh, in Revelation 23.10, it says, Jesus told the church in the ancient town of Philadelphia, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which uh, shall come upon the whole world. Okay, here in, in, in what it says, rapture sequence, where it says, the Lord himself, that is in Thessalonians First Thessalonians 4.16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the angel and with the trumpet of God. And also in Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 4.16, where it says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Yeah, if the dead in Christ will rise first, and then, then in, in, in 4.17, it says, then we who are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Yes. And in First uh, Corinthians 15, oh, 15 let, me, let me just says, say, wait, 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 let me, let me have you, because we're going to be yeah. cut off here, we're going to be cut off here in yeah, a couple minutes. Okay. We have a hard break. Well, I'm, I'm I've heard saying, those verses many you, times. How can yeah. you uh, not, because there's another pastor where they, they don't believe in the rapture. Uh, how can you not? Read that in Thessalonians, where it clearly says the, the dead will rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught in the air. How, what, I agree I, with that. How can you explain that, please? Well, I think it's self-explanatory. When Jesus comes back, he's going to raise the dead, and then those who have not died, who are Christians, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And as it says in First yeah, but... Corinthians 15, which you were just about to read, Paul says yeah. that that we will be changed. We'll be caught, some some will be raised and some will be changed. Those who are changed, uh, I mean, those who are raised will also be changed. But those who are changed without dying are those who are caught up in the rapture. So that's what I believe. Okay, look at what it says in four seventeen. Also, then we who believe who are right. alive remain right. shall be caught up together. Okay, right. so so but that is. That's before the tribulation, it says. No, no, it doesn't. That's why it says. No, it doesn't say that. In in first in first Thessalonians four, there's no mention at all of the tribulation. No, no, no. But but where it says before, where it, in Matthew and 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 in Revelation, there will be great tribulation such as has not never. And then also okay. where it says. Uh, okay, well, in Matthew twenty four twenty one, it does say there will be great tribulation such as never was since the world began, nor ever shall be. But there's no mention of the rapture there, there, and certainly there's no mention of rapture before it. If you read a few verses later, there is a reference to the Lord sending his angels out after, it, it actually says, after the tribulation of those days, there's going to be a bunch of stuff that are mentioned, and it says, and he'll send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds. Uh, some people believe that's a reference to the rapture. If it's not, then Matthew 24 doesn't mention the rapture at all. Uh, there's no mention of the rapture in Matthew 24, so... You, you do read about the tribulation in Matthew 24, but you don't read about the rapture. Or if you do, it's in the reference to the angels gathering people, and that says that's after the tribulation, not before. Um, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, you read about the rapture, but you don't read about the tribulation. This is the problem. There's a handful of passages about these subjects, and none of the passages mentions both of these events in any particular chronology. Like I said, if if the reference in Matthew 24 to the angels gathering the elect, if that is the rapture, I have a slightly different understanding of that, but if that is the rapture, then it specifically says it's after the tribulation of those days. I think that's in verse 29 or 30. It says that. Um, I think verse 29. 
And then just a few verses later, it says, and he'll send out his angels to gather his elect. So we might have the rapture there. I have a different interpretation of that, but one could see that as the rapture, in which case it's not before the tribulation. But one thing we don't have anywhere is a reference to a rapture before tribulation. Now, you mentioned Revelation 3, 10, where he says, because you've kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation that's coming to try those who dwell on the earth. He is telling the church of Philadelphia, which, by the way, isn't really um, much of a church there anymore. But back in those days, it existed. And uh, he's saying that they will be spared through a time of great uh, trial that's coming. But he apparently was not referring to the end of the world because that church hasn't survived till the end of the world. Anyway, uh, I, I appreciate your sharing. I'm out of time for this segment. We have a break and then we have another half hour coming up. You're listening to The Narrow Path. Our website is thenarrowpath.com. And uh, you can donate there if you want because we're listener supported or just take what's there at thenarrowpath.com. I'll be right back. Don't go away. Toward a radically Christian counterculture, as well as hundreds of other stimulating lectures, can be downloaded in MP3 format without charge from the Narrow Path website, www.thenarrowpath.com. There is no charge for anything at the Narrow Path website. Visit us and be amazed at all you've been missing. That web address, www.thenarrowpath.com. Welcome back to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for another half hour taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian faith, or if you see things differently than the host and want to bring another side of the story, I'd be glad to have you call us. Right now, we do have lines open. That wasn't true at the beginning of the program, but we have some open now. And if you want to call now, uh, and if you get in now, we'll get to your call probably before the end of the program. The number is 844 484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. Our next caller is Robert calling from Sacramento. Robert, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hello, Steve. It's nice to talk to you again. Uh, You know, just the other day you were talking about the the covenant with Israel and and Abraham and the, the land of Israel. And you said you don't believe that it's forever, but in the Psalms 105, it says that God remembers his covenants forever. And if the covenant is not true, then what are we inheriting if, uh, uh, by being, how do you say, uh, uh, adopted into the house of Israel? Your voice is fading out. I'm not sure what's wrong with your phone. But uh, you said that in Psalm 105, it says that God's covenant with so Israel is Abraham forever, is with Abraham forever. is is forever, right? Yeah, there's lots of things in the Bible that are said to be forever. I guess we have to ask ourselves what is meant by that word. Uh, the word in the Hebrew is olam, and uh, olam, it can refer to things that are endless, like we usually think of the word uh, forever to mean endless. But olam also can mean things that are very distant, and it often does refer to that, things that are a long ways off. And a lot of times olam simply means a very long time. Uh, and this is known by all Hebrew scholars who, you know, I mean, Olam just has that range of meaning. It's used many times in the Old Testament of things that only last for some years, or at least for time and not for eternity. So Olam doesn't always mean never ending. But uh, I'm, I'm willing to go with forever as the meaning of it when God made his promises to Israel forever. But promises that are made forever are often, at least when God makes them, conditional. Uh, it's like when people get married, they vow that they'll be together for the rest of their lives till one of them is dead, uh, and, and that they'll, they'll never be untrue to each other. But if one of them breaks that covenant, divorces and runs off and marries somebody else, well, that changes things for the one who's left behind. Uh, they may have made sincere promises of loyalty forever, but there's an assumption there that the other party is also going to do that. You can't have a marriage with only one person. And so uh, a covenant, and that's what marriage is, a covenant is when two people make promises to each other. And the assumption is they're both going to keep them. 
And if they say, and I will stay in this marriage until one of us is dead, that means uh, assuming you are also, you know, I mean, there's, there, there's often just the assumption, and sometimes it's stated outright, that both parties have an obligation in this matter. And if so far as both parties meet their obligation, this is going to be forever. On the other hand, if one ditches, well, that, that certainly changes the situation. And the Bible makes it very clear. And I quoted some verses about it yesterday, especially in Jeremiah 18, verses 7 through 10. Make, God makes it very clear. Anytime he promises something or threatens anything, uh, that depends on how the people are. If they, if they turn, if good people turn bad, then he'll, uh, he'll change his mind, he said, about the promises he made to them. If bad people turn good, he'll change his mind about the punishment he's going to give them. God reacts to people. Uh, he has policies. Those who honor him, he will honor. Those who are humble, he'll give grace to. Those who are proud, he resists. Uh, there, are, there are policies in, in any relationship. And the idea of a covenant is that both parties are pledging to be loyal. And as long as both parties stay loyal, a covenant that is said to be forever can certainly last forever. But a conditional covenant, even if it's promised to be forever, can be broken by one party, which means it's over. That which was supposed to be forever has, has ended. So, uh, I mean, God made that very clear about Israel and their priesthood and things like that, that he said we're going to be forever. Uh, he also said, unless, of course, you, you know, unless you break my covenant. If, uh, if you read um, Deuteronomy chapter 28, you'll see that God makes promises to Israel to bless them like no other nation if they keep his covenant. That's in the first 15 verses. The rest of the chapter says, but if you don't keep my covenant, I'm going to do everything opposite to you. He even says, as I delighted to build you and plant you, I'm going to delight to tear you down and bring you to nothing and make, you know, obliterate you uh, if you break the covenant. So, I mean, God is very, very kind and very loving to those who want to be in this kind of relationship with him. But to those that promise to be and then they break covenant, well, that changes things. And God always said it would. So, I mean, to, to say certain promises are made forever doesn't mean that they are forever unconditionally. It's assuming, I mean, on the, on the grounds that you're going to keep yours, I'll keep mine, and this, this goes on forever. But if you break it, well, that's, that changes things, uh, you know. So that's how, that's how we're to understand those forever things. By the way, lots of things in the Bible, too, are said to be forever, but they're not forever in their original state. For example, when God made the covenant of circumcision with Abraham in Genesis 17, he said, this is something you guys have to do forever, for all generations. But in the New Testament, we're not required to be circumcised, but we are required to be circumcised in heart. In other words, there's a spiritual circumcision which replaces physical circumcision. Likewise, God said he was going to dwell in Solomon's temple forever. He told Solomon, I'll be in this house forever. But that temple's gone now, and it's not coming back. Uh, at least God's not going to dwell in it again. He now dwells in a spiritual temple made without hands, made of living stones. Uh, God still lives in a temple among them, but it's not Solomon's. It's a spiritual temple now. He told the Levites they would be priests before him forever. They're not now, but we are a kingdom of priests. There's a spiritual priesthood now. Uh, Passover was to be kept forever, but we don't keep the, the Passover in the biblical Old Testament way. We keep it the way Jesus said to keep it in remembrance of him. And we now have you know, a more spiritual understanding of what we're celebrating. In other words, there's in the Old Testament, there's lots of r rituals and laws and things like that, which the Bible says are forever. But in fact, only the spiritual aspect of them is forever. The, the carnal or physical aspect was intended to be temporary. It was a shadow until the full substance came. And the Bible tells us in Colossians that all that Old Testament stuff, that the shadows, but the substance is Christ. So in Christ's coming, he has fulfilled all these things. His coming is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And therefore, they are fulfilled, but not in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. And therefore, they do continue forever, in a sense. Uh, so <clears throat> the way I would understand all those promises that God made to Israel, uh, or to anyone else for that matter, is that uh, there's three categories of promises God made to Israel. One is the ones he promised, and then he fulfilled them just the way they expected. 
he said he'd give them the land. And in Joshua's day, he did give them the land. So that's been fulfilled. Lots of promises have been fulfilled. Um, and, okay, that's one category. Another category are promises that were conditional. And they would not be fulfilled without the conditions being met. And Israel did not meet the conditions. And therefore, they were not, and they will not be fulfilled because they were conditional and the conditions have not been met. And the third category would be those that are forever, but not in their physical mode, but in their spiritual mode. They are forever ordinances that had a carnal, physical uh, shadow mode. But now that Christ has come, they exist forever in their spiritual mode. So those are the three kinds of promises that I believe are said to be forever. And I believe God has been faithful in all of them. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Good talking to you. Uh, Boyd from Maine, welcome to The Narrow Path. Yes, thank you, Steve. I appreciate you taking my call. Um, my question is on the Millennial Kingdom. It, it's pretty cool that what you just said in that last statement, um, the promise is not forever. And a lot of people take the Millennial Kingdom as a promise to the Jews. And, you know, some people take the Millennial Kingdom as we're living in it right now, which I have a hard time believing. Um I was just wondering if you could just expand on the topic. Why, why would people think? I, I get the seven churches; they're they're non-existent today, and some people say they exist in spirit. Um, but why is it that? I mean, I don't think you believe in a millennial kingdom, do you? I don't believe in a literal future millennium. No. Yeah, I mean, what is the? Why is it then? Why is it pronounced in the Bible in the way that it is in Revelation? Okay. Well, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, let me uh, clarify. The expression millennial kingdom is not found in the Bible. There are many references in the New Testament to the kingdom. It's never said to last for a millennium, though. There's no reference to a millennial kingdom. Millennial refers to something that is for a thousand years. And the only, only place in the Bible that mentions a thousand years is Revelation 20, that one chapter. Of all the chapters of the Bible, only that one mentions a thousand years, and it doesn't mention the kingdom. <laughs> it says they reigned with Christ for a thousand years, which we could presume is the kingdom, but, uh, but the, the expression millennial kingdom is not there. What we do have is a description of Satan being bound for a thousand years and, and people reigning with Christ in heaven during that time, and then Satan being loosed at the end of the time to go out and con cause trouble. This is on earth. He gathers all the nations of the earth as the sand of the seashore against the beloved city. Fire from heaven comes down and destroys him in verse 9. And then there's a judgment, a resurrection judgment in new heavens, new earth. Um, the, the rest of the Bible that isn't Revelation 20 also speaks of many of these things. Uh, elsewhere in Scripture, we read of Satan being bound. Jesus said he had bound the strong man when he was here and was spoiling his house. Uh, other places in the Bible speak of the resurrection and the judgment. Quite a lot of places speak of those. Uh, and those are supposed to happen when Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, he'll raise the dead and judge people. Uh, that's recorded in Revelation 20 at the end of the thousand years. Um, and then, of course, there's the new heavens and new earth. Peter said the new heavens and new earth will come uh, when this heavens and earth are consumed, which he said will be at the Lord's coming, at the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, he said, in which the heavens will be dissolved and the earth will be burned up and things like that. And then he says, we look for new heavens, new earth. So when Jesus comes, he destroys the present cosmos and uh, makes the new creation. This also happens at the end of Revelation 20. What I'm saying is Revelation 20 is the only passage in the Bible about a thousand years. Satan is bound at the beginning of that, just like Satan was bound by Christ when he was here uh, 2,000 years ago. And at the end of that time, Satan is destroyed. There's a resurrection, a judgment, and a new creation. All those things are mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, too, but they occur at the second coming of Christ, which means the event at the beginning of the thousand years is elsewhere in Scripture identified as the first coming of Christ. And the events at the end of the thousand years are elsewhere described as things that happen at the second coming of Christ in Scripture. So we've got the thousand years standing as a placeholder between the first and the second coming of Christ. And a uh, thousand years is, in my mind, symbolic for just a very long time, just like it is when it says in Psalm 90, verse 4, 
a thousand years in your sight are as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. In other words, to God, a thousand years is a short time, but a thousand years is a long time to us. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a thousand years stands for a long time. A watch in the night stands for a short time by comparison. Or as it says in for Second Peter 3, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years, or a thousand years is like a day. Obviously, a thousand years just means a long time to God, is a sh- uh, or to us, is a short time to God. Um, when the Bible says God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, it doesn't mean literally a thousand. When it says he keeps covenant to a thousand generations, it's not limiting it to a thousand generations. When it says a day in your courts is better than a thousand, or when uh, Moses said to Israel, may God multiply you a thousand times more than now. These are all cases where the number thousand just means a lot more, a lot. A thousand is just a big round number for a lot. It's not, it doesn't mean a specific number. And therefore the thousand years in Revelation 20, by all millennialists take it to mean uh, a long period of time between the binding of Satan at the first coming of Christ and the uh, resurrection and judgment and new creation at the second coming of Christ. And therefore, it'd be the uh, reference to the church age. But it's all very symbolic, and that shouldn't surprise us. It's in the book of Revelation, which is almost entirely symbolic. So, um, you know, for, it's amazing how many people take tons of stuff in the book of Revelation as symbolic, but then when they get to chapter 20, they want to take it kind of literally. And I think, well, that's, I'd rather take it the way I take the rest of the book of Revelation and let the rest of the Bible interpret it for me. So that's, that's, the, that's the way I myself look at it, obviously, um, different people have different ideas, and they're welcome to, because we're all welcome to have, to reach our own conclusions. Uh, Judith from Connecticut, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Good. Yes, um, I want to believe a lot of what you say, but one of my turn turn off is that you said some time ago, I was listening to you that you used to hold certain beliefs yeah. and you change them because a few of you guys have come out at scriptures with a dif- with different eyes. I think that's a, a big, a wrong thing. You, we have to t- get before the word and let the spirit guide us and unravel the revelation of the scripture. If we are going to leave, if we are going to teach the truth, the spirit has to be the one to teach us what God is really saying because only he knows the truth. So let me see if I understand you. You like my teaching in general, but you don't like the fact that I change my mind when I see the scriptures in a new way. And uh, you know, the, the, to me, I would prefer to sit under a teacher who changes his views when he sees that they're not scriptural. You see, a lot of pastors are taught their views uh, when, uh, in the seminary they go to or the Bible school they go to or the, or the person goes to a certain church when they first become a Christian and they get all the doctrines of that church built into their head. And there's no, there's no guarantee that the first people who teach you the Bible are the ones who see it correctly. They might, but they might not. I mean, in, for many people, the Jehovah's Witnesses are the first people who, who, who get them or the Mormons. Or some other, or some biblical, or some Protestant denomination, or maybe Catholics, or Orthodox, and and so these can't all be right. But you can be pretty sure that those people who are converted into those systems and trained in those systems are going to see the Bible through that light. And they're and now we, if they're in the right group at the beginning, then excellent. Maybe they never have to change their views at all. But every group thinks they're the right group. So you know, I, I don't know what you're what your uh, affiliation is, but let's, let's just say, let's just say you're a Protestant of some kind, maybe a Lutheran. Uh, then wouldn't you say that if somebody grew up as a Roman Catholic and interpreted the Bible through the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church, that as they became a Christian, grew in their knowledge and read the Bible, they should change their views so that they, so that they would have views that are more agreeable with the Bible. I believe that. Um, I guess some people feel maybe insecure if they if some teacher has said, I used to believe this, but I now believe that. Well, okay. I mean, I guess I, the kind of person that would be insecure, I think, is a person who doesn't want to think for themselves at all. They just want to find a teacher who's quite sure that he's right and has always believed that he's right and will always think that he's right so that they can think he's right. And uh, then they can just kind of hitch their wagon to that horse 
and say, okay, I'm, I'm with him because he's sure he's right. Uh, I've never been that kind of a person myself. I, I don't want to be with a teacher who insists that he's always right, even when he clearly isn't. Uh, you know, as I've studied the Bible and I've been teaching the Bible for over for about 55 years now, I've studied it before that, obviously. Um, in, in all those years that I've been studying and teaching the Bible, I've seen a lot of things that I was taught by my by earlier churches I attended uh, and which I believed. I've seen that they don't have a biblical leg to stand on. They're just traditions of that group. And therefore, I have changed my views on those areas in order that my views will align with what the Bible does say rather than what the Bible doesn't say, at least as I see it. Now, nobody has to agree with me. And therefore, if it bothers you that I change my mind and you think, well, how, why should I believe what Steve thinks? He might think something else next week. Uh, well, I would, I would advise that you don't, don't just believe what I believe. I I think the best thing you can do is study the Bible for yourself. But I, you know, if I believe something differently than what you've been taught, I would suggest what you should do is say, "Oh, I never thought of that. That way maybe I should look at the Bible and see if that's correct." Now, I hear all kinds of people float views I don't think are correct. Like like the lady who said that she thinks the woman in Revelation 12 is Ruth. Uh, I I thought I'd heard everything before that, but I'd never heard that before. But uh, you know, I don't mind her presenting it, and I don't mind considering it. But if I consider it and think, uh, no, I don't think so, and there's no reason to do that, uh, well, that's, I at least have thought about it. But if I say, well, that's not what I was taught, so I'm not even going to think about it. Well, I'm not that kind of person. I like to, I'm, I'm interested in truth. I'm not just interested in settling on a view that my friends and my family agree with so that we'll all be happy. Uh, I, I've always been more interested in truth. And if what I believe, and even if what I've been teaching is not true, I'm actually glad that someone points that out to me. And I'm glad for the opportunity to change because I, I'm a teacher. The Bible says teachers will have the stricter judgment. If I just teach what I was taught, and when I see evidence in Scripture that I'm wrong, I just blind myself to, no, I'm not going to change my mind to that then I'll be continue teaching what I know isn't scriptural. At least my congregation may still think I'm okay, but does God? And so, you know, a teacher needs to be more concerned about God than about what people think. Paul said, if I was seeking to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ in Galatians 1.10. So uh, I guess I'm just, I approach the whole thing differently than you do. You think it's a, a weakness to say, oh, I was wrong. I now see the scripture teaches this, so I'm going to teach this thing that the Bible says instead of what I used to teach. That's a weakness to you. To me, that's a strength. I, I'd, I'd want that in a teacher. But I don't say everyone has to want it. So, I mean, you can certainly find teachers who, who don't take that approach. Uh, you can probably find a lot of teachers who will never change their mind, no matter how much scripture con contradicts them. Okay, let's talk next to uh, Linda from California. Linda, welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm not super prepared because I wasn't expecting to get in, but basically my question is um, about Acts ch chapter 2, and uh, my question is this. When, when the people, um, I don't know, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know how to word this. Um, I want to know if you think that when everybody was filled with the Holy Spirit and were baptized in Acts 2, do you believe that that meant that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues? Or do you believe that they were um, um, baptized in water? I'm, I'm very... You know, I'm, I'm so confused on that. Okay, well, what we read is when 120 Christians were in the upper room, when the Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Spirit, and they spoke in tongues. Okay, so all, all 120 of them spoke in tongues. Now, later on, before the chapter is over, there's 3,000 new, new believers who are now Christians, and we read that they were baptized. That means they were baptized in water. 
I mean, generally speaking, unless it's uh, qualified, baptism usually means in water. It's true, the expression baptized in the Holy Spirit appears in uh, John the Baptist speaking and also in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, but uh, when it doesn't mention being baptized by the Spirit, baptism almost always refers to water baptism. So that the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8 of Acts says, here's water, what prevents me from being baptized? Or uh, in the house of Cornelius, when people got saved and uh, they were heard speaking in tongues and so forth, Peter said, what, uh, how can we withhold water from those who have received the Holy Spirit? He means b- baptism. Uh, so when people were converted, they were baptized in water. I think Acts 19, the first seven verses, gives me the impression that when they were baptized in water, it was customary then to lay hands on them so that they would also be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So being baptized in or, or filled with the Holy Spirit or receive the Holy Spirit. These are different terms that are used kind of interchangeably. So, um, so, so if it doesn't mention otherwise, the word baptize is going to refer to water baptism. But there are times when it is modified, uh, I believe. And our, our, the context makes it clear it's talking about something else. But water baptism is a very common uh, repeated phenomenon in the book of Acts. And it, it was associated with salvation. If you got saved... If you believed and repented, you were expected to be baptized, uh, generally speaking, the same day. Uh, Now, Saul of Tarsus uh, seems to have gotten converted on the road to Damascus, and he wasn't baptized for three days after that. But I personally think he was saved for those three days. He just hadn't met a Christian yet who could baptize him until Ananias came to him. So I believe a person who's repented and believed is saved, but they're supposed to be baptized in water, and that's, that's assumed everywhere. Now, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, a much less frequently used term in the Bible, um, that is something that was also customary. After a person was baptized in water, we read in Acts chapter 19 that Paul baptized these people in water in the name of the Lord Jesus, and then when he laid his hands on them, they were filled with the Spirit. Now, people who were spilled, filled with the Spirit in the New Testament very often did speak with tongues. Perhaps they always did. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say they always did, and therefore we can't argue necessarily that they always did. We don't have biblical authority for that. But we do read that they often did, and it's possible that they always did. So so many people today, especially Pentecostals, would associate speaking in tongues with the evidence that a person has really been baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't ever speak of uh, of, of that phenomenon with that significance. That is, there's never anything in the Bible that says, you will know that you got baptized in the Spirit because you speak in tongues. Uh, it, that, that kind of a teaching is not found in Scripture. But we do find many times those who are baptized in the Spirit do speak in tongues. And I have no reason to believe that that can't be a very general experience of people when they're baptized in the Spirit, even today. But it doesn't anywhere say, that speaking in tongues is a necessary um, evidence that somebody has been baptized in the Spirit. All right, we're out of time for today's program, I'm sorry to say. My apologies to those of you who we didn't get to. Uh, We'll be on again tomorrow, Lord willing. You can call then, and I'd love to talk to you. The Narrow Path is listener-supported. We pay uh, lots and lots of money to radio stations to stay on the air, but we don't have any sponsors. We don't sell anything. We just let you know you can donate if you wish. Uh, You can go to our website, thenarrowpath.com. There's a tab there about donating if you want to use it. That's thenarrowpath.com. Let's talk again tomorrow.